everyone? <laughs> Isn't that always the thing? Like, good, I said good afternoon. No, um, I won't do that, I promise. But I do want to welcome you to our session today. You could have been anywhere in the world and you chose to be here, and I want to thank you sincerely uh, for your time. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so what we'll be talking about today is the world of mobile app development with Drupal. We'll be going into some high level technical recommendations, some applied usage example from our portfolio. But first, um, I think it's appropriate that we introduce ourselves. So I'll pass it off. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Taylor. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our session. Uh, appreciate to see you here, 3 p.m. afternoon after lunch break. I'm Alex Shaprov. I am CEO and founder of FiveJars. We are Drupal uh, development agency. I've been doing Drupal for almost 14 years, since uh, 2010. Uh, based just outside of DC, have technical background, and today I'm going to cover some tech insights that we've learned uh, from all our projects that we uh, implemented. Hey, okay, I'm Alex, <laughs> and I will talk about technical stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and see, this is the problem because I'm so short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Taylor. Uh, I am the digital marketing manager here at Five Jars. And I have just over eight years of experience in the field. Um, but working with agencies, this is my first um, working with Drupal. And uh, it's been a really amazing experience. We, I went to my first DrupalCon this year in Portland. This is my first Drupal GovCon. And I think a lot of people in the room will know what I mean when I say, like, you know, it feels like I found my people. There's a lot of uh, uh, nerdiness around this, and I'm really appreciative uh, that you will let us nerd out on this today. So I'm not going to bore you with our elevator pitch of who Five Jars is, but I would be happy to do so afterward. Please come find me, and I'll give you some business cards. Let's connect. Um, what I will tell you is that we are a full-service digital solutions agency, and we have worked with many different industries to support specific missions and projects to the best of our ability, the highest quality, meeting and exceeding industry standard. I guess I did kind of do a little bit of an elevator pitch. And that includes mobile, uh, custom mobile applications. So we're going to be going over the tech side of a few different types of mobile apps, specifically around our experience with different organizations and industries. We'll be going over native mobile apps, hybrid mobile apps, ones based on framework, embedded web view, and embedded web app, and then finishing off with a progressive mobile, uh, sorry, progressive web applications, PWAs, um, to round it out. So to start us off, one of the first things you're going to be thinking about is a decision maker um, implementing a mobile application, right, is control. What are the limitations? What can and cannot be customized, et cetera? So if you're wanting to have the most control over every aspect of your mobile app, you're going to want to go with something fully native, um, but that's going to give you the highest price. It's also going to be the longest uh, time to market. And in terms of our development approach, I'll pass it off. Yeah, when we look at the setup of the team for mobile development for native apps, fully native applications, basically we should keep in mind a few different teams. Team number one is the team that builds API for that application. Uh, team number two, that would be uh, iOS team, usually like Swift developers, Swift UI framework uh, team, that's the second team. And the third team is Android developers, right? They all should have different uh, skill set and eventually the native mobile applications will require like triple, uh, you, you will need to triple your resources, like uh, web team, iOS team, and Android team. So keep that in mind uh, and let's get back to the team. Yes. Um, 
So then when we go on to native base on framework, here are some of the pros and cons and again when to use. We're going to be lowering the threshold of implementation here by pairing a native app with an existing framework. And by having some of this work done for you, this means a faster time to market than a fully native application, but does hold some drawbacks when it comes to things like UI consistency across platforms and finding the right person or persons to have that specific dev knowledge uh, to hire. So this could be the right fit depending on your timeline, budget, and business needs, but you know, is in everything in that case. And then for the development approach, uh, yeah, you remember, like in the Drupal, here you need to double sometimes. So think about frameworks like uh, Ionic or React Native or Flutter or .NET MAUI, which which replaced Xamarin you know, as far as I remember. So basically, you need a web development team who will be in charge of APIs and exposing data, and also you will need a little bit of model development team just to kind of build a wrapper to release it to App Store or Google Market, so still some effort from mobile developers will be required. But still, kind of the effort is a little bit lower in comparison to the native mobile applications. So moving on to web apps. So progressive web apps or PWAs uh, have a great time to market. This can be a great choice depending on uh, where you're trying to go with your business organization. Um, it's also, it can be a great implementation if you're pushing a lot of changes or updates um, as there's just one code base for all of the platforms. But with a lot of industries where your customer is expecting you to have a mobile application that they can easily access that um, is customized in the ways of your specific businesses can be challenging as a PWI um, has to be accessed through a browser. Um, this avenue, however, could be a bridge if you don't have the time or resources for mobile app development, for example. Uh, yeah, and in this case, I love this slide because our work goes to Drupal developers. And we want that, so eventually you need to build a website and there's only one additional step you have to make it responsive, uh, responsive as well as to uh, add some additional stuff like manifest JSON, additional JavaScript to make it kind of compatible with PWA uh, requirements. But the biggest effort that will be required is just making sure that it will work in offline mode, meaning that you need to uh, expose data and make sure that it stays there in order to work in offline mode when you have no connection and when you have no network, for example. Mm -hmm. And for example, let's see. Oh, I don't think that it is. Aha, there it is. Uh, for example, Drupal GovCon has partially used APWA as well, and enjoy that cameo of my cat in the screen capture of this. So moving on to hybrid applications. So this is an example of building on top of an, of an existing web application, and this can save a lot of time and money and is a great option if you already have a web application and you quickly want to launch a mobile one. However, when using native and web embed, there are some drawbacks when connecting both, like the app not working if your site is offline or down for maintenance um, and that type of thing. But it is very uh, successful when you have an, when you want to implement an app that has you know that simple functionality and um, you don't really have a budget for a new app. Uh yeah, when it comes to the implementation itself, uh, the use case and, and, and the team setup is pretty similar to the previous one. The only one difference that is, so think about it is about iframe, right? We all can insert iframes in our web pages, so web embed means that we, we embed iframe within the mobile application. That means that whenever a server goes down, your content is not going to be available in the application. So basically, your content is not available. And offline, you can always remove header, 
folder, but everything that is in between might be inserted into application. Lowest effort, fastest timeline, but it doesn't work in offline. And it might feel like the application itself might be built with one kind of design, but stuff that is embedded might be coming from a completely like, different world with CSS and stuff like that. So yeah, but it's, it's easy, it's super easy. Just insert, insert it as an iframe. And another hybrid app application, well, app application option is Ionic Portals. So again, this is a great option if your time to market window is short and you can overcome some of those limitations of the web views. Uh, additionally, with Ionics over the air, the OTA integration, an engineering team could iterate more quickly and fix critical issues by pushing updates directly to the mobile application. And we will be diving a little bit deeper into this approach as we have a real life usage example of our implementation that we've done for one of our clients to share. But first, we're going to talk a little bit more about the technical elements of this with Alex. Uh, yeah, again, kind of visual slide. You remember the previous slide with iframe web and bed? Same thing here, but you get access to all native APIs and native features of mobile applications. So you can, you can use NFC, camera, geolocation, haptics, different swipes, and everything that comes as a part of like native application and native experience. Uh, and it will support offline mode if you build it kind of correctly and put it into the architecture of uh, higher portals application. So it's just like supercharged native web view with access to native features and everything that is part of all that. So for Apple Music, this um, leverages the best of web and native. On the native side, Apple developed uh, tabs for listening, browsing, searching, and song controls. And the rest of the content, like the web ads and playlist cards, are all uh, the web content. So this was really interesting to me. I did not realize this, that they were using these types of um, implementations and applications. Uh, but this allows the web developers to quickly and easily update and display changes uh, immediately to the app. So if a, new, uh, if a new hit song comes out, for example, they're able to very quickly and easily implement that. So. Uh, yeah, think about it, that all this content is just coming from one CMS. For example, the like, top songs uh, or stuff like that. So it, it's consistent uh, across all the platforms, uh, Android phone, Apple TV, even like, on the, your laptop. So this stuff is coming as a web application. There is one more application, probably you've never heard of it. It's called Netflix. Uh, and, and they use similar approach. So they embed like these micro front-end experiences into their application. For example, there's FAQ section or help section that describes everything. So it's being inserted into application as web view. Uh, and when everything gets updated, for example, in CMS, I hope they use Drupal, it all then gets deployed into all these different platforms, like on your TV, the mobile app, tablet, laptop, and just the web experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and when, it, when it comes to when it comes to the architecture of your portals, uh, so basically you need to build a JavaScript library. So you build JavaScript library that you can use on your website. Or, and then it gets connected to model application through some specific libraries that I'm going to cover later. Drupal serves as an, API, as an API, and this comes from the projects that we've implemented. So Drupal serves API, uh, uh, it exposes API points, we build a library, we add it to the website, then model application. Uh, in model application, it gets packaged as a one package, then it got shipped to App Store, Google Play Market, and then it just talks to the API. And this, in the same way, we just add this JavaScript library on the website, so we don't need to kind of duplicate the effort. We just build it once, ship it to different places. Uh, 
when it comes to releases, this is where it gets interesting. Uh, standard uh, traditional model development approach, so you pack everything, then you release it to App Store or Google Market, Google Play Market. Then it gets then it needs to go through verification, authentication, so that the Apple team will review these changes. So when it comes to a Yoni part, you don't need to do that. So you pack this application once, then you can update these, these JavaScript libraries, and then they will be pushed like, right away into application. So you don't need to wait, and uh, you don't need to wait a couple of days in order to see your changes there. And it's called uh, OTA, over the air update, so they have some specific mechanisms on how you can do that and deploy that. And this is this works really well. Now we change something on the website, it gets us and then we change it within the application right away. Like once we deploy the website, it's in the app. So, uh, like I talked about earlier, for uh, applied usage of um, uh, Ionic portals, brings us to one of our longest standing clients, YMCA of the North. So the YMCA of the North team aimed to expand its mobile, its mobile presence and offer members access to virtual and on-demand programs via mobile. So they already had a web application, but there was a need for a more direct approach to the end user through a mobile application. And ultimately, because of all of the things that we talked about before with all of the different types of um, mobile app imp implementation, we ended up recommending um, Ionic portals. Since this tech does let us add uh, web-based features to native mobile apps safely and without having to rewrite everything that they already had implemented from scratch. So ultimately, it would be the best approach since it would save us and the client, you know, time and money. So we took on full responsibility for adopting and setting up this technology. And we had some big wins using Ionic portals. It allowed us to integrate web features into the mobile app quickly and efficiently, saving a lot of time and resources. Um, and it really allowed us to explore those uh, different strategies and um, implement it very quickly um, with an accelerated launch. However, it wasn't without its challenges. So, for example, uh, we were faced with uh, cross-origin resource sharing, or cores, constraints as the embedded web, uh, sorry, as the embedded app was web-based, and this mechanism restricts web apps uh, from accessing resources on other websites for security reasons. We ended up configuring the web app backend to allow requests from the embedded mobile app so that it could access the necessary resources and overcome the course constraint. So what this happened, what this resulted in was um, it sped up the development process by 3x. It saved our client around 2,000 engineering hours and only needed to, we only needed to manage one code base, right, instead of three, further saving that time and money. And the key result that we really wanted to focus on is the product that looks, feels, and runs like a native mobile app. Um, so how did we do that? Let's get into a little bit more specifics and tech insights. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, now what we're done with like that high-level overview of different architecture types, I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the kind of tech side of things, how exactly we implemented that, with some of the examples, probably different tools that you might eventually to take a look at. So first, first thing is API. So everything is based on API. What we've learned uh, from building dozens of uh, applications and APIs that for mobile apps, RESTful API probably will be uh, our go-to recommendation. And there are a few reasons for that. It's better for large applications when logic should be part of, like business logic should be part of the API, then uh, so you need to use RESTful API because then you will need to duplicate the effort by building that logic in the cloud of mobile app, web app, so it's easier just to return data that different teams might consume eventually. Uh, and it goes back to the performance, because RESTful API will, will perform better in the long-term perspective. 
for several projects. We use JSON API uh, or uh, GraphQL. It worked great, but at some point we struggled with performance because it's too broad. Different teams might consume it differently. They have just access to all the objects. So at some point we wanted to limit access to some things that we wanted to expose from the CMS. There is a good quote to pull the work. Choose REST if you have non entity data and you want to expose. Um, in all other cases, choose JSON API, and we kind of agree with that. But since model apps are too specific, we tend to go with RESTful API for cases like that. Uh, API specification, so this is must have for any APIs. Documentation is must have should be well documented, so other teams might consume your API in the right way. So we built our own applications. We um, worked with other vendors who built model applications, and we only supplied them with data from API. So as, as, as long as you have documentation, the they will consume your APIs in the right way. Uh, avoid uh, backward uh, incompatible changes. Um, treat your APIs in contracts. As soon as you sign a contract, you cannot change it. You can only amend your contracts, right? Treat the same way, think about API in the same way. So once it's there, developers will use it, and then you have to kind of amend and embed your changes into your existing API. And it's always easier when you when you want to kind of write big changes into the architecture of your API. It's better to just release a new version. For example, API version two, and then support version one, and sunset it at some point. And how exactly you can decide what sunset it, I'm going to cover it in some of the next slides. Uh, when it comes to the tools, there is one great tool called Swagger. Uh, it's an open source API documentation tool. It allows you to build uh, documentation, design your APIs. They do have open source version as well as uh, like software as a service where you can host your uh, documentation somewhere in the cloud uh, and helps to align all the teams. Specifically, if you work with other teams, like three, four, five teams who uh, are looking at API, so definitely try this to uh, work out. It might help you to avoid some miscommunication and useless meetings when it comes to like, data and, and, and kind of correct data that everybody expects. Uh, here's an example. You can just use the online editor. You can document the API. It's usually appealing. It's easy to manage. Uh, and, and it's really easy to understand different API points. But now, I have a question. Like, how many of you have ever built an API? Please raise your hands. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, you guys are here. Uh, you will have any additional kind of stuff you wanted to share with us. Uh, you are always welcome. But I hope you never experienced API performance issues because we did. <laughs> and we've learned. We've learned so many things. And we'll only possible to cover all of them. But first thing is optimize your databases. There are a bunch of different things, what you can do. What we've done, we've, we use a separate database, just to normalize database, where we use search index APIs for this, but just do not retrieve data directly from database. At some point, we'll just crush. Uh, if you use JSON API, there is one module called JSON API Search API. Yes, there is two APIs in the name. But eventually, it helps to improve the performance because it pulls everything through kind of from index database. Uh, delayed indexing, you don't need to index everything right away. Uh, you can build some kind of queue so when something gets published, it do not need to appear in the file application right away or in the API. You put it in the queue and then at some point it will appear. Uh, cache, um, yeah, important thing. There are a bunch of different things that you can do. Uh, challenges is how to, the biggest challenge with, uh, with cache is not, not how to cache things, but how to invalidate things. And fortunately, we don't have time to cover this. I think there will be one additional talk about this, about cache. 
and API. And rate limit, this is something that we uh, introduced and figured out that we need that uh, when we had like thousands of requests to our API and then it went down. So at this point, okay, we talked and we realized we need to introduce some limits. Maybe there, there was an instance of application uh, that was sending a bunch of requests to API or something like that. So to so avoid API, API shutdown, incorporate this into your architecture and think about it from, from the beginning. Uh, yeah, when it comes to API operations, I mentioned that you need to understand how people consume your API to handle some unpredictable things. Uh, what we always do, we build some kind of a point, uh, we call it kill switch, where we control uh, versions uh, and we collect a lot of different versions of user agents, maybe web application, mobile application, like any other types of applications. We collect uh, versions of the APIs that are being used by different apps. Uh, we just maintain a system log of records, how people interact with API, do they plot something in there, or do they just use get endpoints just to understand where we need to focus in terms of performance. And whenever something gets stuck on the actual device, we need a mechanism how we can kind of kill this process and restart the uh, application, for example. For example, someone might be using like outdated uh, mobile app, right? As soon as we see that in the request, we can show a message that like, hey, you need to go to App Store and update your application in order to continue to use it, for example. Okay. Yeah, now when we are done with kind of API stuff, let's talk a little bit about technologies that we can use. Uh, one of them is React Native. Uh, this is a great framework for brand new applications uh, or if you want to integrate something into an existing application. Uh, it's owned by Meta, like Facebook. Uh, and the good thing is that if you know how to build a basic web application, it means that you can build a mobile application. So just JavaScript. Same things as we use with Drupal, with our well, with CMS. Uh, so you can, you can build it all out. Uh, going back to kind of that uh, thing that I mentioned at the beginning, it's just a, a library, a JavaScript library that you build and then reuse on the website and in the mobile app. And with this, you can build the whole application or only part of it and just insert it there. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, take That's a break. A transition. You're doing great. <laughs> um, so, uh, just shout out, do you know any examples of React native applications? Anyone? Netflix. Netflix, yeah. It's a good one. Netflix. <laughs> yeah, so um, there are many, many applications uh, that are using React Native, and uh, one of the ones that I was very surprised about uh, is Discord, actually. Uh, as an avid gamer myself that I use this, you know, uh, most, most uh, every day, calling myself out, um, <laughs> I, uh, I was very impressed to know that, you know, this, this uh, applied knowledge was um, occurring, you know, uh, every day in, in uh, your life. Yeah, my third application is Amazon. And I, Amazon? When, I, when, when I found this out, I was really shocked. It was built on React. <laughs> uh, yeah. If you don't want to use React Native for some reason, there is another one called Ionic. It's great for new applications and existing ones as well, so you can just reuse some stuff. And good news is, if you know how to build basic uh, web apps, uh, web applications, you can even build a mobile application using Ionic. Uh, and if you're not going to do that, there's a great library of UI components that you can reuse. You can just pull them in, use them on their websites, and it's a great tool to 
build mobile applications as well. Specifically, if you're going to build it from scratch, so you can definitely, you should definitely consider that uh, technology. And portables, this is kind of an extension to all you make, and it's not a new game from Valve uh, that they left back 10 years ago. So it's a technology that allows you to embed like, web views into mobile applications. So uh, on the slide, you can see that right there is a mobile app, but some things you can really embed there. And it gives you access to uh, native features, and there are two primary things why this technology is cool. First, you can break down monolithic applications into smaller microservices. So when you build a like, checkout process, your web team can build checkout process and then embed into a model application. This is more complicated, should be like PCI compliant and comply with all these different things. And you can distribute the ownership. So web team will own this checkout experience, but the mobile development team will own their experience, how people get there, how they log in, how they find different products and things. So this is kind of a great tool on how we can build microservices and distribute the ownership of this. Question to you guys. Have you ever heard of uh, or used Ionic or portals? Raise your hands if, if you ever uh, did that. Oh, oh, way oh back. great. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> really, really happy to have you here. Yeah, when it comes to how exactly a portal works, so there is one additional tool called Capacitor. This is kind of an extension to Ionic Portal, and this specific library allows Ionic Portals to talk to native APIs and native features. So any portals itself is just like a JavaScript framework. Without Capacitor, it cannot get access to native features. And even if you are not going to use Ionic uh, portals, you can still use Capacitor. Uh, capacitor uh, is a thing that is being used by both teams, like model development uh, team and web development team. And uh, model developers can really define what kind of access you need to these native APIs, native features, like NFC, camera, geolocation, so it's really powerful stuff, like push notifications, and stuff like that. So, and if you don't want to use React Native and portals, or you, can, you want to build something custom, Capacitor will get you there to get access to native features. Uh, and it has a uh, bunch of official and unofficial plugins. Uh, for example, again, access to keyboard, uh, cameras, and stuff like that. So you don't need to build that from scratch. There are a bunch of things already included into this uh, technology. Uh, when it comes to challenges, was kind of authentication. There's only one slide where I have code, and this is the slide. So we really have big, huge challenges with like cores. Uh, across the region with source sharing and because application itself and our micro application like micro front end, front end application they were hosted in different domains so we had to deal with that there is an example of a service YAML file um, that allowed us to manage that kind of transition from one domain to another domain and still um, get people authenticated based on this Main recommendation, don't ever use cookies for authentication if possible, use just GWT talking because it's simpler, stateless, supported by different systems and proxies and NA platforms. Uh, yeah, all, all in all, I think we, based on our experience, we build different types of applications, we put together the stable. It might be kind of subjective, just based on our experience, but native applications, they're expensive, longest time to market, but they provide great performance and amazing user experience. Right? Just see different screens, see different swipes, all these native features and APIs. Uh, native, frame, uh, native applications with frameworks, so expensive, but not as expensive as native applications. Long time to market, 
uh, you might have a bit lower performance, but an experience might be inconsistent. For example, with different swipes on Android and iOS, they might be considered differently by the system itself. So there might be some slight kind of inconsistencies. Uh, when it comes to building a application with like portals, it's lower budget because you build it once, uh, shorter time to market, specifically with OTA updates, over the year updates. And again, it might be not consistent with the operating system. That's why same features, uh, double taps, and stuff like that. Other than that, it's fast, simple, no offline mode, no AV features. But it, it works. And PWA is just building a website, making sure that it's optimized, it's really suitable for like simple applications, like application for agenda for Google.com or for Google.com. Uh, and you don't need to release that to App Store. It's just like a deployment to the website, and that's it. Yeah, I think this is it from my end. Can you want to add something? Um, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so um, now I would love to open it up for a little bit of uh, Q&A. But before I do, again, I just wanted to reiterate and thank you so much for taking the time and joining us for this session. Um, so, does anyone have any questions? Yes. How much time does it take to make one of these web apps? Yeah, well, I think it depends on the application, yeah? Um, yeah, it really depends on the project itself. Mm -hmm. uh, simple projects, they might take like a few months because like features are limited, but in order to build native applications, you just like, to need to triple this time because you want to incorporate changes to the API, you need to build like that feature uh, for iOS application as well as for Android application. Yeah, it, it depends. The, the answer is like all in all. It's just, it really depends on the project itself. And I, again, I was just going to add, it, it also it goes back to, uh, in the beginning, talking a little bit more about, you know, how much control do you want, you know? What specifically do you wanna, want them to be able to see, the end user? Do you want the end user to be able to, like, register for programs that you're running? Do you, do you want them to... Um, be able to access a calendar event, you know, that kind of thing. So um, every app is going to serve different projects in that way. It just kind of depends on, like, what do you already have set up on your website um, and, like, how much are you really building from scratch? Yeah, so sorry for the two broad answer, I think, from one month to several years. really depends on the project. But let's talk afterward if you have a project in mind. <laughs> Yes. So I was checking out my office website, and um, they have, I was looking at the pricing, and they have a monthly fee of like four grand, but they are, they're also on GitHub. So I'm wondering, like, if I just want to tinker with this, do I really have to sign up for pay, or is there a way to, like, an open source way to play with it? Yeah, well, they have open source libraries. So if you want to kind of work with that, you can use that. but. They also offer some kind of software as a service thing, so as every single company, even Slugger, right? They have open source library and they can host their documentation in the cloud. So yeah, this is just the business model because they have to they have to make money, right? <laughs> Sure, so if you're working in Ionic or hybrid app, how much does it cut down on processing? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we compare the testing process for a full native applications, you need to have a specific team that tests API, but usually we try to cover this with automated tests. And you need uh, people who will test application on iOS device, Apple TV, Android, so on. you need to scale up your team to cover that. With hybrid applications, you can build everything and uh, you can test everything in browser, just using your regular QAs, manual QAs, like with your Drupal websites, and then we test this one time 
when it's embedded into your application, and it really scales down the number of hours needed for testing. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you again so much, everyone, for coming. Please, please connect with us on LinkedIn. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your sessions today and tomorrow.